What's going on, everybody? So good to be back with you guys. My name is Lindsey Huey. If you are tuning in for the first time, my wife and I are the lead campus pastors at our Oasis Church Cattle Mills location. So good to be with you all today. And uh, good to be in your house, your car, your cubicle, where you're watching from. Maybe you're walking your dog, huh? Any, any dog walkers out there? Any dog to the walkers? Yes, looking at Max's face. Love it. All right. So good to be with you guys. Um, if you're tuning in, welcome. And um, I want to encourage you to share this. Share it right now. Stop what you're doing. Stop. Share it. This is, um, when you share it, this has the potential to literally transform somebody's lives. Uh, because it's the word, it's the gospel, and that's exactly the intent of why we do these podcasts, to help transform people's lives. And uh, we're not the ones who transforms people li- people's lives, it's the Holy Spirit who does it uh, through us. So share this now. Like it, get the word out about it, tell your friends that we're live. My wife's going to be coming in live at 1 p.m. today, so you're going to want to tune in to what God's laying on her heart for today. It's going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, listen, if you are uh, tuning in, I want to know who you are. Go ahead and uh, let me know that you're tuning in. I want to chat with you guys maybe throughout this podcast. What's up, Janet? So good to see you on here. And um, man, today we're going to keep this thing simple. And, um, you know, I heard somebody say it takes a good theologian to, uh, to, to complex, I'll put it this way, I heard somebody talk about, I'm not sure if they refer to the gospel specifically, but I am, it takes a good theologian to uh, make the gospel complex. The gospel, the good news, is not complex. It's actually very easy. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you notice the title, Following Jesus is Easy. It's, it's so easy. It's so easy. We, meaning pastors, ministers, leaders, we've made it so complex. We've made it so difficult. We've made it so challenging. You know, you know what we've done is we've taken, we've taken this gospel and when people give their life to Jesus, now we say, here's the law. Now you gotta here, you can't see it in the shot. Here's the law. Now you gotta now you gotta obey it. It's on you to now obey this book. It's on you to obey it. You you've got to be the one to obey. And if you don't obey it, you're gonna die and go to hell. Can I tell you that's not the gospel? As a matter of fact, that's not the gospel at all. It's not once you get saved, now obey this book, do it on your own, figure it out. And if you don't do it, if you don't do it just right, you're going to hell. That's not the gospel. Can I tell you, can I tell you the gospel, the good news? As Pastor Caleb said in his podcast, it's, it's the God news. Can I tell you that this right here is so easy to follow when you do it the right way? There is a way to do it. There, there's a right way and there's an extremely wrong way. There's, there's such a wrong way and the wrong way makes it so difficult. It's such a heavy burden for people to, to, to obey God's word. To obey God's word is so easy. It's so easy. It really is. It's not difficult. The enemies lied to so many people saying to obey this book is difficult. The enemies use pastors like myself to say this is, this is so challenging and it's on you to do it. And if you don't live a consecrated life, then, then man, you're not going to go higher to new levels and it's on you to live that consecrated life. Can I tell you, it's not on any one of us to live a consecrated life. It's, it's, not, it's not on any one of us alone, I should say, to live a consecrated life, to live a life of purity and holiness. Did you know that you cannot live a pure life by yourself? You can't do this thing by yourself. As a matter of fact, we get no credit when we when we are living a consecrated life because it's not within ourselves. It's not just us by ourselves making that happen. Str- being a strong-willed Christian only goes so far, and it's really not even being a Christian. Being a strong-willed person only only lasts for so long, and then you want to give up. It's one of those things that so many people have been lied to, whether by the enemy or by other well-meaning Christians, well-meaning pastors, ministers, and leaders. 
Do you know there's a lot of Pharisees today in the body of Christ, just like there was when Jesus walked the earth? Did you know we're still living in the New Testament? The New Testament has not come to an end. We're still walking that thing out. Can I tell you, we're not living in the millennial reign of Christ. We're still in the New Testament. Pre-rapture, Jesus has not come back to get his church yet. There's still time for you to say yes to Jesus. There's still time for you to give your life completely over to Jesus. You know, I heard Reinhard Bonnke say this morning, I was listening to him, while I was at Discount Tire, getting a piece of metal taken out of my tire. Can you believe that, Max? I done rolled over a piece of metal, didn't even know it. Raleigh's in the room. Say, hey, Raleigh. Hey, guys. Hey. Max is in the room. Say, hey, Max. We got, we got the best media crew. Go, white boy. C-R. So, okay. I don't know that name. Who are you? Raven. Y'all know who that is? C-R-U-S Ader. U-S-A D-E-R Raven. G give me your actual name because I don't know who you are. I love you too, but... I was listening to Reinhard Bonnke this morning. Sorry, lost train of thought. Listening to Reinhard Bonnke this morning, and he talked about how the gospel is not us finding God. The gospel is God finding us. Nobody found the Lord. The Lord found us. Oh, what's up, Jason? Good to see you, man. That's who you are. I know you. The gospel is not us finding God. Reinhard Bonnke was talking about how people would come to him and say, I I finally found the Lord. I found the Lord. And I understand what they're saying when they're, I understand what they're meaning when they're saying that. But the truth is, we don't find the Lord. He finds us. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. Jesus came to this earth. We did not go to Jesus. He came to us. And as a result, we now have a decision to respond back to what Jesus came to do and what he already did. This is important to understand. You cannot obey this book. This is the Bible, by the way. Just in case you didn't know, you might have thought it was like the Quran or some other book, but this is the Bible. You cannot obey this book by yourself. You cannot do this by yourself. Peter is spending time with Jesus. The disciples are there. Peter was one of the disciples, and Jesus, the Bible says, takes off his robe. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going, so he was able to humble himself and be the leader that he was called to be. The Bible says that Jesus said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. He came to give his life as a ransom. For anybody that would take advantage of it, anybody that would take hold of it. And he and he he takes off his robe and he picks up a towel and he 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 begins to wash the disciples' feet. And Peter makes this, he makes this statement. He says, Lord, you're not gonna wash my feet. Lord, I'm not gonna let you do that. Now, washing feet is a representation of servanthood. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to love you. I want nothing from you. I'm here to serve you. No strings attached. True love is no strings attached. I'm, I'm here to do this for you. And Jesus came and he's, he's washing the disciples' feet and he gets to Peter. And Peter, you know, P Peter makes this comment. He goes, Lord, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. Now, what does this washing speak to? We have to understand that the washing of the feet isn't just Jesus simply serving his disciples. There's a deeper meaning. It's, he's not just washing. The, now, you got to remember that in the, in the practical, and hey, Amy, hey, Cheryl, good to see you guys on here. In, in, the, in the practical, the washing of the feet, they had sandals back in the day, and they had dirt roads, so their feet were filthy. So Jesus is doing them a favor. He's washing their feet. But there's a symbolic meaning that's much deeper. There's a spiritual meaning that is much deeper than washing feet in the natural. And Peter goes, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. What does the washing of the feet represent? Purifying. Purifying us from the inside out. Purifying us. Hey, Jimmy, good to see you on here. Purifying us from the inside out. That's what the washing of the feet is. The washing of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is G who's the one that is doing the washing? Is Peter doing the washing? 
Peter's not doing the washing. Why do we feel like it's our job to wash ourselves? We cannot wash ourselves. We cannot. What does the washing represent? The washing represents the washing represents us walking out this word. We cannot walk this word out by ourselves. That is not that is not the good news. Religion says this, oh, you're saved now? Now it's on you to obey this book. It's on you to obey the word. It's on you. Good luck. And if you don't do it, you may die and go to hell. Wow. Well, thank you so much, religion. That's a lot of pressure. I can't, I can't do that on my own. That's what religion says. It's on you now to do it. And if you don't do it, my God, you're a sinner. You're just a little heathen out here. You can't come to church anymore because you got sin in your life now. That's what religion says. But what does Jesus say? What is, what, what, is, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? I know in Hunt County, many people are bound and blinded by that, that, that demonic theology. Paul says, who's bewitched you? Who has, somebody's put a spell on you. Somebody's blinded you to the good news. At first you heard the good news and you were following it. And then somewhere along your journey, you went back to now it's on you to obey the law. It's on you to obey the Bible. Now, now you're trying to do this by yourself, by works. Maybe if I work hard enough. Maybe m- m- strong willed within myself. I, I'm, I'm not going to look at pornography today. Oh, I'm not going to do it. I, I'm better than that. I, I can do this on my own. And if I don't do it, Jesus is going to be mad at me. That's the whole point. You can't do it by yourself. That's the whole point. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to drink alcohol again. I'm not going to do it. I'm putting it down for the last time. I, I, I can do this. I can, no, you can't do it. That's the whole point. You can't do it. You cannot do it. You can't, I can't do it. You, you can't. I'm not going to blow into a fit of rage anymore. I'm so strong within myself. I can, I can control myself. No, you can't. That's why Jesus came. That's the whole reason why Jesus came. Because we cannot. Religion says it's on you. No, it's on you to live a pure life. Somebody comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you're good. And Jesus goes, I, <laughs> Jesus goes, only my Father in heaven is good. What's the point? The point is nobody is good. Within and of ourselves, nobody is good. You're not good. I'm not good. doesn't matter if my strong willedness keeps me from, from, from whatever temptation that the enemy throws my way. doesn't matter. Eventually, I'm going to break. And the only thing that sustains me is Jesus. So Jesus is having this moment with Peter. This is the whole point. This is the gospel. This is the good news is it's so easy to follow Jesus and we make it so tough because we feel like it's on us to follow him. It's not on you to follow him. But pastor, what about to, you know, uh, uh, p- pick up your cross and follow me? We're going to get to that. You cannot follow Jesus within and of yourself. You can't do it. You will fail every time. You will fail so hard every time. You will stumble and you will fall. But it is so easy to follow Jesus when you do it the right way. There is, there is one way to follow Jesus. There is one way to follow him. There's only one way to follow him. There's not seven different ways. It's not, I'm going to go to church, and then I'm going to tithe, and then I'm going to be really good throughout. I'm going to be really good. Nobody is good. I'm going to be really good throughout the week. Nobody is good. I'm going to be really good. I'm going to be really good. I'm going to, I'm going to try really hard this week not to sin. I'm going to do my best not to sin. That is... That, my friend, is religion. When we say to ourselves, I'm going to do my best not to sin, we just move back underneath a curse. Who has bewitched you? Paul told the church in in, in the book of Galatians. Who's bewitched you? There's an evil spell on you. Let me tell you what Jesus is doing here with Peter. Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to do it. You're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to do it. No, Lord, you're, you're too holy for that. And Jesus says this. Jesus says, if you do not let me wash you, you cannot have any part of me. Jesus was showing them 
that if you wash your own feet, it's not good enough. So many people are trying to wash themselves by being strong-willed. They're, they're trying to clear their conscience by going to church. Hey, Hannah, that's good to hear. Glad you've been tuning in. It's great to have you. There is this, there is this lie that says it's so tough to follow Jesus. This is why many people go to church for a few weeks and they stop going because they hear a cursed gospel. They hear a distorted gospel. They do not hear the true gospel. They hear, oh, you're saved? Oh, we celebrate that with you. Angels are rejoicing in heaven. Hallelujah. And then they say, okay, now, discipleship is this. Are you ready? Are you ready to be a disciple? Now follow this book right here and do everything it says. And if you don't do it, you might go to hell. And they totally, totally miss out. They totally miss what Jesus came to do. The people who were trying to disciple other people. Let me tell you the gospel as simply, maybe as I can put it. The gospel is not, oh, you're saved. You gave your life to Jesus. Great job. Now here's the law. Here's the Ten Commandments. Here's the Bible. Now you follow this on your own, and if you don't, can't promise you you're going to make it to heaven. You, you, you'll probably wind up burning in hell. That's not the gospel. How could you put this entire book on one man's shoulders, one woman's shoulders, and say, now it's on you to fulfill this? The gospel is simply put this way. Oh, you're saved? Oh, we celebrate that with you. Whoa, that's amazing. Now, this is what you got to do. You ready? You ready? This is what you have to do. This is the gospel. I'm, I'm being serious. This is the gospel. You ready? This, this is what you have to do. And this is all you have to do. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's it. I could walk out of here right now. This is the gospel. I'll put it a different way. You ready? You just got saved. We celebrate that with you. You're saved. You're a Christian. Praise God. Now, continue to be in love with Jesus. Don't ever take your eyes off of him. Don't ever do it. And when you open up this book, don't see this as a book of do's and don'ts. See it as a love letter. Have the right perspective. Let, let this book, this book right here is Jesus in book form. You're getting to know Jesus' heart when you read this. And the word itself, the word itself cuts and transforms you as you embrace it. Our job, we have one responsibility in this thing. You ready? We have one responsibility. Our responsibility is to say yes to Jesus by faith. That's our one responsibility. If you read throughout the New Testament, it's a reoccurring theme. By faith. By faith. Rely on the grace of God. Rely on the grace of God. Rely on the grace of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. What is relying on the grace of God? Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the only one that can clean you up. He's the only one that can purify you. He's the only one that sanctifies you. His blood is the only thing that redeems you. It's the only thing. It's the only thing. It's not how good you are. It's not how strong-willed you were this week or last week. It is the only thing. Carol, good to see you on here. Christy, good to see you on here. Rebecca, good to see you on here. He's the only, he's the only one that can purify. What, what was Peter's job? What was Peter's job? When Jesus washed his feet to kick and scream, Jesus will not wash somebody's feet who's kicking and screaming. He will not wash their feet when they're kicking against, when they're kicking against Jesus's will. He's not going to do it. How do you wash somebody's feet in the natural when they're kicking? I'm kicking my feet underneath the table right now. You can't see it, but how do you? You can't. He's not going to hold your foot down and wash it. What was Peter's job? To yield to Jesus. And trust that Jesus was going to wash his feet. You know, maybe one of the toughest jobs as a Christian is to trust that Jesus has already purified us. And to trust that Jesus is putting his desire and his heart in us. That's probably the hardest job as a Christian. 
But can I tell you, it's the easiest thing to do. I know, I know it sounds, I know it sounds contradictory because lots of people have this mindset and Rawlett, Hunt County, all over the place, they've been raised in a way of you need to work for it. Our society is that way. You're not going to get a paycheck unless you work for it. So we've been trained in such a way to where if you want the reward, you've got to work for it. And can I tell you, there is no work good enough that you could do or I could do that could receive God's eternal gift. It is a free gift by God's grace that comes when we put our faith in what Jesus did. That's all it is. I trust you, Jesus. I trust in what you did for me, and I trust that you are giving me the desires that please you. Him who started a work will complete the work the Bible says. But he completes it in those who yield. You can't kick and scream and complain. You've got to yield and trust. That's all it is. So Jesus says this powerful statement. He says this. He says it pleases the Father to give the kingdom of God to people who are like children who know how to trust. It pleases to give the kingdom. And he compares, he compares, he compares us to, to like children, like little kids who just trust. Hey, son, the moon's, the moon's made out of cheese. Is it really? Wow, I didn't know that. Don't believe anything. What's the point? Jesus is saying kids, kids trust so easily. Why, why as adults, why teenagers trust so easily? At what point, at what point are we able to stop trusting? This is what happened. Let me read this. Galatians 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, Paul writes. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus's, Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? By obeying the law of Moses? Did you receive the Holy Spirit because you obeyed this entire book? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you get saved because you were so perfect in the beginning? And then Jesus said, oh, wow, they're so perfect. Oh, I'm going to save them because they're perfect. No. That's the whole reason Jesus came. He said, I came for the sick, not those who think they're already saved. Not, not those who are perfect. I came for those who know that they're not perfect. That's the, that's the gospel. And religion has come in and distorted. Had, we've preached a distorted gospel. It's on you to save yourself. Well, I thought it was on. Nope, it's on you. Well, I, I thought Jesus died on the cross. For, well, he, he did die. He, he, religion says, oh, well, no, Jesus died on the cross. Oh, he, he definitely died. But, but, and, and he rose from the grave, absolutely. And, and the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave, oh, it lives in you. This is, this is what religion says. Oh, the, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, oh, he lives in you. But it's on you to obey this. It's on you to obey it. What is he doing? He's moving your focus from trusting in the blood of Jesus to trusting in ourselves. That's religion. Going from trusting in the blood and the work on the cross to now it's on you. So that's why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden, my yoke is easy and my burden is, this is easy. It's easy to follow me. All you have to do is truly follow me. All you have to do is keep your eyes locked on me. That's it. Just keep your eyes locked. Keep your eyes locked. Don't keep your lies locked. Keep your eyes locked. That's, yeah, a little dyslexia kicking in there. Keep your eyes locked. Pastor, how do I do that? How do I keep my eyes locked? This is the heartbeat of the Father. You read this book, and you trust that Holy Spirit is producing This book is seed, and you trust the Holy Spirit is watering it and producing fruit in you. Revelation will hit you. There's a story in the Bible after Jesus was resurrected, and he's on, he's, he's on this road called Emmaus with two guys. 
And the two guys didn't realize it was Jesus. Their eyes, their eyes were blind. They didn't know. And then when they finally got to a destination, the Bible says Jesus took bread and he broke it. And when he broke the bread, the, man's, the, the two guys' eyes were open and they realized it was Jesus the whole time. Can I tell you, the way, the way that you follow Jesus, because he's not here in flesh, but he's here in spirit and he's here in word. He's here in spirit and he's here in word. And the Holy Ghost is all over this. And you have to have an awareness that the Holy Ghost is throughout the entire scripture. He, he, he's throughout this entire. When Jesus broke the bread, their eyes were open. You know what that represents? The breaking of the bread. So you have to open this up yourself and get your own revelation. The two men said, didn't our hearts burn when we were walking with this? With, with this man, they didn't realize it was Jesus. They said, didn't our hearts burn when we were walking with Jesus? It's even right now, some of you guys are watching and there's this, there's this desire by the Holy Spirit that's tugging you in to want to get a hold of this word, to get a hold of this book, this Bible, this word, this life-giving, spirit-breathed word of God. That's what this is about. Stop relying on pastor's revelation of who Jesus is. Stop relying. Can I just be honest with you? St no, you know, I'm not going to say names. Stop relying on famous preacher's revelation. Get your own revelation. Stop being lazy and get your own revelation. These two men walked with Jesus for a while, and then when he broke the bread, their eyes were open. You're going to have to intentionally follow Jesus. You're going to have to walk with them. Walk with them. Talk with them. Hang out with them yourself. Don't just come to church and rely on somebody else's revelation of who Jesus is. You know, you know what happens when we go to church and we do that? There's a stirring by the Holy Spirit inside of our soul and inside of our spirit that says, yes, yes, yes. And then we leave church and we never break the bread ourselves to get our own revelation. You got to break this thing yourself. You got to break the bread opened. Look into the bread of life. He is the manna. He is the answer. He is the answer. This is it. Many Christians are involved in witchcraft and they don't even know it. They don't even realize it. Many Christians are involved in witchcraft and they don't even realize it. You say, Pastor, how are they involved in witchcraft? Because they feel like they think it's on them to purify themselves by obeying the Bible. It's not on them. It's not on you. So many Christians are involved in witchcraft. Who's bewitched you? Who's put an evil spell on you? I'm reminded of COVID. When I got hit with COVID, back in 2020 of the fall of 2020, there was a fogginess that hit my mind. And it took, it took a few days for that fogginess to leave. That's what, that's what religion is. It fogs our mind and our perspective. And it convinces us that it's on us to make ourselves pure. And the truth is only Jesus can make you and me pure. He's the only one that can do it. So what's our job? What is our job then? If we can't make ourselves pure, if we can't produce pure and godly desires in us, what is our responsibility? What, what is our responsibility? To trust Jesus. To trust the work He did and to trust that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is producing those desires in our life. The desires that please Him. He who started a work, talking about God, our Father, He will complete it. Your job is to trust and have faith. And faith comes. How does faith come? By hearing the Word. By getting your, per getting your own revelation of who Jesus is. I challenge you, turn off. Now, if you're, if you're driving or whatever, that's fine. If you're, if you're like on the road or you're on, you're on a road trip or whatever, that's, that, that's one thing. But I challenge you, if all you're doing is listening to a podcast and you're not opening up this book during the week, that's a problem. 
because you're relying on somebody else's revelation of who Jesus is. I challenge you. I challenge you. to, And I, I know this is going to sound kind of contra, contra, uh, contradictory. Is that the right word? Contradicting. There we go. Because you're listening to a podcast right now. But I want this podcast to drive you to, as soon as we're done, if you're able to, you open up the book yourself. I challenge you with this. Limit how many podcasts you listen to. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in what to listen to. And then I challenge you every morning and every night, open up this book. Don't read it to, to prep a message or a sermon. Don't read it thinking about your coworkers tomorrow and how you're going to preach the gun. Just read it for yourself. Read this love letter yourself. Read it yourself. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not, Paul says. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. What is salvation? What is, do many people even know what salvation is? What is salvation? What is salvation? What, what, what is, what's, the, what's the manifestation of salvation? What is that? Can I tell you what that is? It's your spirit coming alive because the Holy Spirit comes into your spirit, man, and it causes your spirit, man, to come alive. That's why you're a new creation. So before you're saved, you're not a new creation. Before you're saved, you are, you are soul and you are body. Your soul and body is what you are. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What burns in hell is your soul. What lives etern eternal is your spirit. Your spirit, man. God counts people as dead until they get saved. Before we gave our life to Jesus, God saw us as dead. We were dead in sin. We were dead. We weren't, we weren't truly living. God, God puts a greater value on our spirit than he does our flesh. This flesh is, is what gets us. This flesh is, 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 is mortal. It's, it's temporary. This flesh right here is not going to last forever. But our spirit man does last forever. So God, God sees us as dead because we're not truly living. Truly living according to God is becoming immortal. And until you say yes to Jesus, you're not immortal. You're only mortal. You're not immortal. You're only mortal. You're dead. That's what salvation is. His spirit comes into your spirit, man, and your spirit comes alive. Your spirit awakens. That's what happens. So did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you get saved because you were so perfect? Let, let me just let me share this. You can't be perfect without the Holy Spirit. You can't you can't be you can't be holy enough without the Holy. If you're not saved, you're not holy at all. You're a sinner and your destination is hell. Did you know that nobody condemns you? But if, if you're not saved, nobody's condemning you. God's not condemning you. Jesus isn't condemning you. Holy Ghost isn't condemning you. Did you know that people condemn, them, condemn themselves to hell? The Bible says that those who don't know Jesus are already condemned. And they're already condemned because they have not put their faith in Jesus. That's the gospel, putting your faith in Christ. But it's not the, it's not the, it, there's another distorted gospel out there. It's this, it's this, uh, I don't even like to use the word grace because it, 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 true grace, true faith is not, I'm going to live how I want to, but I know Jesus, I, I, I believe Jesus died for me and, um, 
you know, I just, I really don't want to die and go to hell. So I'm going to, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus, but I'm going to be so carnal on this side of eternity that I'm not going to, tr- when you truly get saved, when you truly get saved and born again, if you've heard, if you've heard the true gospel, you're going to keep your eyes locked and Jesus is going to be the one that purifies you. His blood instantly, his blood instantly, his blood instantly, what it does is your spirit man, your spirit man comes alive. Your spirit man is pure. That's what it is. And it's a washing of the blood every day, every day. What, on our, on our own ability? No, by trusting in the Holy Spirit, by relying on the grace of God. And then when, when impure thoughts hit your mind, practically, when impure thoughts hit your mind, you just you shift your focus. You, when, when impure thoughts hit your mind, you get your focus on Jesus. Say, Jesus, thank you. I cast down that of vain imagination. I cast down that vain imagination. I cast down that impure thought. I cast down that, Im- and I just lock eyes with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood is washing my soul right now. Your soul has to be renewed every day. That's your mind, your will, your emotions. Your spirit is ain't instantly purified by the blood of Jesus. Your spirit man, who, who you really are, your spirit being, you're really a spirit being, you're immortal, the Bible says, you know, it sounds wild to talk about, but it's the word. It's it's simply the word. You you are immortal, you're immortal, and, and your spirit man is instantly purified by the blood. And it's that easy just to believe that. Woo! Oh man, wow, I'm I'm a spirit man. This is great. Holy cow, why do I still deal with unhealthy thoughts? Well, that's not your spirit, man. That's your soul. And your soul has to be renewed. Your spirit man doesn't have unhealthy thoughts. It's your soulish man that has unhealthy thoughts. So you've got to get so full of the word that it permeates your soul. And you're meditating on the word and you're thinking about the word. And and Jesus is revealing more of himself to you. When people get a revelation of the word, they're getting a fresh revelation of Jesus. They're finding out a new aspect of who Jesus is. That's what revelation is. Jesus showing you another part of himself. That's When somebody gets a revelation of healing, that's Jesus. Jesus is the healer. When somebody gets a revelation of how God's our provider, they're getting a revelation of who Jesus is. They're getting a revelation of who our Father is. That's all that is. That's all that is. And people like to go around and gloat and boast about, oh, like, let me tell you this deep revelation I got. How can you boast in something? How can you boast in something that you didn't even work for? You, didn't, you, didn't, you can't boast in salvation. You didn't work for it. Jesus worked for it. And Jesus gave it to you. You didn't pay the price. He paid it. I didn't pay it. He paid it. Who's bewitched you, church? Hunt County, Rollette, who has cast this evil spell on you? You're involved in witchcraft and don't even know it. You're putting the responsibility on yourself to obey the law when really it's so easy and so simple. Just fall in love with Jesus and stay in love with Jesus and be in love with him more today than you are yesterday. Just keep falling in love with him, and he'll, he will just graciously give you, he will just graciously give you in his time and fresh revelation of who he is. As you just keep falling in love with him, he's just going to give you more and more and more and more and more and more. That's how easy it is. Jesus says the revelation you do have, if you don't use it, I'm going to take it away from you. It actually says it will be taken away from you may not be that he takes it away. It could be that the enemy comes and steals it because you're not claiming it. You're not clinging to it. You're not hanging on to it. But the revelation that you do use of Jesus, it will increase and it will grow and you will get more revelation and more understanding and more insight. If the gospel, if Jesus is, if Jesus dying on the cross and being resurrected If, if the cross of Jesus ever becomes old to you, then you have fallen far away from Jesus. If you care more about 
fresh revelation, then your relationship with Jesus, then you have fallen away. When, when, I, when I mean fresh revelation, I'm talking about like you've graduated from the cross of Christ. Nobody ever graduates. The cross of Christ is our foundation, and we build on that foundation alone. Everything that comes to us on top of that foundation is fresh revelation that points us back to the cross. Every revelation that we receive from the Father points us back to the cross. That's what it does. It just points us back. What does that mean? That means faith in what Jesus did. You have to remind yourself, I am not good. But it's Jesus in me that makes me good. I'm not good, but Jesus in me makes me good. You may say, Lindsay, I've been dealing with this like sin, this habitual sin. I've been, I've been, I've been wanting to get set free from it. Let me tell you how easy it is. Put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross. The power of sin was broken on the cross. Put your faith. It's so easy. It's so easy to do that, but we complicate it. We make it so complicated for people to receive Christ and then to walk out, walk this thing out. You can't walk it out by yourself. That's the whole point. Anytime you try to walk it out by yourself, you, you get in front of Jesus, and now you become the leader. Anytime we try to walk out the gospel by ourselves. We're the leader, and we've moved back into, well, we've moved into a curse. We've moved back into the old covenant. And the old covenant, that's the point, it's the old covenant. It don't work anymore. It don't, God doesn't use the old covenant anymore. In the sense of making people right with himself. That's not how God rolls now. The only way God rolls is by putting your faith in Jesus, like true faith in Jesus, like really believing, really believing. And the Holy Spirit points you back to Jesus, really believing in what he did, really believing that on the cross, the power of sin was broken. Oh, Jesus, I just lean into you. I embrace you. I have awareness of the Holy, of Holy Spirit in my life, causing and creating good desires in me. Galatians 5 says the Holy Spirit produces these fruits and it goes through all nine of the fruits. And then it says against these there is no law. The old covenant was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant is written on hearts. It's being led by the Spirit. And the only way you can be led by the Spirit is if you have the Spirit in you. The only way you can, you can truly accomplish everything God's called you to accomplish is by realizing it's not you that heals, it's not you that saves. It's not you. It's not you that sets the captive free. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. To set the captive free. Well, what's the beginning? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. What enables those blind eyes to be opened? The Spirit of the Lord upon you and in you. So you walk away from a moment where God uses you and you give glory to God because you realize within myself, I am not good. I'm not good at all. And Holy Ghost, that was you moving in me and through me. I give you all of the glory. Man, Holy Ghost, I tell you what, that, that thought came to tempt me to, to sin. But man, I tell you what, I leaned into the blood of Jesus and that temptation, that temptation fled, it ran, and I didn't give into it. That's true grace. When you trust the work of the Holy Spirit in you, when you trust the work of the Holy Spirit in you, you trust, you lean in. A thought comes, and you say, Holy Spirit, I thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus, thank you for your blood. Holy Spirit, thank you. You're giving me the desire to say no. And you just begin to love on Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you more. I love you more than that temptation, that desire. And that is what Jesus then, listen, Jesus comes and he removes that desire. 
He removes that desire. You have to realize who you really are is your spirit, and you're already purified. You're already sanctified by the blood. You're already justified by the blood. Relate to your spirit, man. Don't relate to your soulish man. If you relate to your spirit, man, your soul will become renewed. But if you relate to your soulish man, you'll forget more times than not that you're really a spirit being. This is what happens. We forget that we're a spirit being and we begin to live out of our soul and out of our carnality, out of our flesh. And then when we sin, oh man, I can't do this. No, you're exactly right. You can't do this. So you have to remind yourself, no, I'm a spirit being and in my spirit, I'm completely sanctified and pure by the blood and I put, see, what am I doing right now? I'm using my soul. I'm using my soul to remind myself that I'm a spirit being. And what is it doing? It's, it's setting my mind focused on the right direction. So now when I go out into the world and I see people, the Bible says, Paul says, we no longer evaluate people from a human point of view. Let me tell you how we should evaluate people. You ready? Either alive or dead. That's how we should evaluate people. Not like, oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I know Max, and uh, Max in the room. Let me use him as an example. Yeah, I know Max, and Max, uh, you know, I know he's saved, but I know, I, I know, I know Max. You know his past and the tendencies he struggled with, and so, you know, uh, Max is probably just going to go back to his to his old tendencies. Nope, that's a human point of view. The new way we evaluate people is Max is saved, he's delivered, he's set free, and my job is to encourage Max and love Max. Paul says you have to stand firm by your faith alone. Max can't stand firm by my faith, but my job is to encourage Max. Not evaluate him by his old nature. And that's what so many people do in Hunt County. They evaluate people by their old man. Oh, yeah, I know I know so-and-so, and I tell you what, so-and-so, they're... Um, so and so, there. You know, I tell you what they. Uh, did you hear what so and so did? Because I tell you what, it's just so. Oh man, I tell you what, those people over there. You know, they're just man. They're 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 the worst. They're the worst people. They're awful. They're terrible. And uh, you know, I tell you what. You know, we don't want them coming to our church because let me tell you why we don't want them coming to our church because they're they're the kinds of people that would just spread gossip and rumors and those kind of people. They say one thing and they do. Are you kidding me? Jesus said, I will not reject anybody that the Father sends to me. Those are the exact kind of people that need to come to church and encounter the real thing, not religion. They need to encounter the real truth. And the people who say, the, peop, the very people who talk about other people that way, what they're doing is they're evaluating those other people from a human point of view. Not by what God has sent his son Jesus to die for. So many Christians believe in people's old man that there's more power in the old man of an individual than the life-giving spirit that transforms the individual. We need to start evaluating people the way God evaluates people, either alive or dead, and then let the Holy Ghost work on them. Let the Holy Ghost work on them. I'm telling you right now, at the Cattle Campus, if you're listening, we will not evaluate people from a human point of view. We will evaluate them through Holy Spirit eyes. You're either alive or dead. And if there's addictions and strongholds and things that... That, that Jesus needs to continue to set them free from, we will not stand in the way and say, you don't belong here because you're still sinning. Newsflash, we have all sinned. Newsflash. Man, that's religion right there. We're not supposed to be God's bouncers and defense attorneys. We're called to be witnesses. Let the Holy Ghost convict. Let's just love. Does your love provoke people to righteousness? 
That's what our job is, to love people and see them the way God, either alive or dead. And then we teach them to go back and rely on the grace of God. That's our job. That's our job. How foolish can you be, Paul says, after starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? After starting your new life, you're saved. And then you went back thinking to yourselves, it's on you now to purify yourself. No, nope, Peter, Peter had to yield and let Jesus wash his feet. Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you don't understand. You, you cannot have any part in me. You have to let me purify you. But Lord, and this Peter didn't say this, but it's like so many people, but, but, but what if Holy Spirit doesn't? What if Holy Spirit doesn't purify me? What if Holy Spirit doesn't? This is what people think without realizing this is what they think. Well, in other words, I don't trust Holy Spirit to do his job. So now I'm going to take Holy Spirit's job and make it my responsibility. And I'm going to be strong-willed enough to purify myself. That's, that's the way many people live. Because they don't trust and now they're involved in witchcraft and they don't even know it. And then what they do is they teach witchcraft. So the very witchcraft they're involved in, they teach witchcraft to other people who just got saved and they lure them into witchcraft. And witchcraft begets witchcraft begets witchcraft. It just keeps producing. You eat the fruit of your lips and so many people. Jesus said, hey, listen. These Pharisees. He, he, he talks about the Pharisees, and he says that the Pharisees, they, they, can't even, they can't even obey what they're telling other people to do. They can't do it. If you truly, when you truly, when you truly trust the Holy Spirit, what you'll find is there is a supernatural thing that happens where he really begins to give you God's desires. It's amazing, and it makes it so easy to follow Jesus. But it's not this fake faith. It's not this fake faith. Oh, I'll set a prayer, and I'll go to church, and I'll pay my tithe, and I... Yeah, but it's still on me to make sure, you know, you know, you don't, don't look at porn tonight. I, 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 you do that. You're sinning. You're going, no, nope, I'm just going to trust you, Jesus, that you are stripping every desire out of my soul because I'm a spirit being, and my soul has to be renewed. So, Holy Spirit, I'm trusting you that you're stripping that out. And I just yield. Peter had to yield and let Jesus wash him. He just had to sit there and let Jesus purify him. And that's exactly what needs to happen. I trust you, Jesus. I trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do, and you're going to purify my soul. You're going to purify my mind. The battle is not mine. The battle is the... That's what that means. The battle is not mine. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. You have to do this because I can't do this. Why are you trying to become perfect by your own human effort? It's the Holy Spirit. Through the blood of Jesus that perfects us. That's all it is. So it's easy to follow Jesus, isn't it? It really is. I know I've said a lot, but it really is easy to follow Jesus. In simple terms, if you're saved, all you have to do Keep your eyes on them. That's all you have to do. That's why it's easy to follow Jesus. Get your mind off of the do's and the don'ts and get your mind on Jesus. Fill your soul with the word. That is Jesus. That is Jesus. Fill your soul with the word. Fill it. Fill it, fill it, fill it. So good to see so many people tuning in today. And uh, Rebecca, Hetty, Jonas, good to see you on here. And Greg and Christy, so glad you guys are tuning in. And um, man, there is, I wanted to keep this thing brief, but it's one of those things of like, that's, it's our job. It's our job. It's our job as, as believers. Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit leads us in the truth. And when I say it's our job, I'm not saying within and of ourselves. 
what I'm saying, it's our job to, to present the true gospel to people. But honestly, there's so many people who, if they've heard the true gospel, they don't, they don't really believe it. Because they think it's too easy. And it needs to be difficult. They, they think to themselves, it needs to be difficult. They think to themselves, it's, it's on them to be righteous and holy and pure. And can I tell you, it's not on you. It's once you put your faith in Christ, that's all you have to keep. The very thing that got you saved is the very thing that's going to keep you pure. Your faith in Christ, day in and day out. Your love for Jesus day in and day out, that's what keeps us pure. Because you're putting your faith in what Jesus did. He did the work. Our job is easy. I just trust the work that he did. And I'm thankful for the work that he did. That's our job. God, I'm, I'm thankful for the work that your son did. Thank you, Father, for the work that you did through your son. And I lean into that. And that's where I find peace. That's where I find true love. That's where I find joy. All of the fruits of the Holy Spirit come out of the work that Jesus did on the cross. And people think, no, that's, that's, too, that's too easy. It's too easy. There's something I have to do. Yep, there is something you have to do. Trust. Trust. No, that's too easy. I've, I've got to go out and I've got to, I've got to make this thing happen. No, nope, you just got to trust. It's easy to follow. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Father, I lift up anybody watching right now who's struggling. God, there may be people watching who they've never heard the gospel before. This is the first time they've actually heard the good news. They've actually heard the gospel. They thought it was on them to purify themselves. They said yes to you, and then they just went right. They went, they went right into works, right into works mode. And that's why they're frustrated, easily aggravated. They look miserable. Because they're not, they're, not, they're not fully trusting you. Out of, out of their mouth, they say one thing, but their actions speak differently. Out of their mouth, they say, I trust. But then internally, they believe. They believe it's on them to keep themselves pure and righteous. It's on me not to sin. It's on me not to, not to stumble and fall. And that's not the truth. It's actually Jesus on you to keep us pure and righteous as we trust in you. And you do and you will. You do, you do today and you will tomorrow. Every day it's easy to trust you. That's how simple it is. So Father, I break the spirit of religion off of people's minds. I break that curse and that spell that stronghold off of people's minds right now in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you that your gospel goes forth with the power of the Holy Spirit and it sets the captive free. It goes forth and it sets the captive free. Eyes are being opened right now, spiritual eyes. It's setting the captive free. It's setting the captive free. Father, I thank you that the pure, true gospel sets the captives free. I thank you. Holy Spirit, you're going to work right now, and I thank you you're going to work. I have awareness. I have an awareness of your presence, an awareness of you, Holy Spirit. And you're going to work. You're the best evangelist. And you're ministering to hearts right now, and I thank you, Lord, that people are trusting in the work of the cross and the work of what Jesus did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're watching and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to say this right now. Jesus, I give my life to you. Holy Spirit, come awaken and make alive my spirit, man. I fully surrender. I fully surrender to you, Jesus. Wash me with your blood. I repent of all of my sins. I turn from my sins. And I focus on you, Jesus. 
Repentance of sin means you turn, you turn from evil, you turn from yourself, and you fully trust Jesus that he has saved you, that he has washed you and forgiven you of all of your sins. Shame is leaving right now. Rejection is leaving right now. That orphan spirit, I bind you in Jesus' name. Come out of anybody watching right now. I loosen my brother and sister in Christ right now. And I thank you, Father, you're setting the captive free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for opening blind eyes. We thank you, Lord, that you're moving right now through this camera. You're moving and you're touching hearts. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If, you, if you've just given your life to Jesus, say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. You're my Master. I look to you and I keep my eyes on you with the help of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So listen, the Holy Spirit will help you keep your eyes on him. He'll remind you to keep your eyes on him. So just do that. If you just gave your life to Jesus for the first time, like you just gave your life to Jesus, let me tell you, let me tell you how you know if you just gave your life to Jesus. We had a young man this past Sunday give his life to Jesus out at our Cattle Mills campus. And I asked him, after he gave his life to Jesus, I said, man, what do you feel like? And he said one word. He said, new. Wasn't scripted, wasn't planned. You know you've given your life to Jesus when you feel new. I feel new. Hallelujah. Let us know. We want to resource you. And um, if God did something in your life on this podcast, share it with us. Write that down. So good to have so many people tuning in. and uh, Man, I love you guys. Share this podcast. Get the, get the true gospel out there to people. Share it. Get this gospel out there. And tell people. Man, tell them. It's not on them to keep themselves pure. It's not on them to keep themselves pure. The only thing that's on us is to yield, and then Jesus will wash us. He's the one who purifies us. It's on us to yield, which means we have to trust. That's all we have to do. That's how easy it is. I just trust Jesus that you're going to do what you, what you say you're going to do, and that's give me the desires that please the Father. My spirit's already purified, and Jesus, you are purifying my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, and my flesh is going to follow. This, this natural body is just going to follow. And, man, you're going to do some amazing things. Do some amazing things. So, listen, I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Pastor Jody is going to be coming live here at 1 o'clock. You're not going to want to miss it. God bless you all. And uh, Wild Ones, I'll see you tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at our mid midweek service out at the Cattle Campus. Peace. Okay.